You know, he was talking the other night about some uh, baseball something, and he knows more stats and more history and more, you know, everything. He absorbs everything. And, but the amazing thing is he remembers it. After he absorbs it, it sticks there somewhere. So uh, I just think he reads for, um, you know, for whatever's there. It's a lot of business, but he's also very interested in what's going on in the community. He's interested in the sports uh, all over the country, um, particularly the Huskers. Um, you know, everything. It's amazing to me how much he knows and retains. He's an intense worker, but I don't know if that's the same as being a hard worker. Uh, not that he wouldn't work hard and doesn't work hard, but he's at the point in his life now where I think, um, you know, he has a lot of control over what he does with his time. So uh, I think he worked harder when I was younger in the sense that he spent, well, I was gonna say that he spent more time at it, but he still spends a lot of time at it. You know, he would live at the office. If he could live at the office, he would just have the bed there and uh, live there. So, I still don't know the answer to that. I have to think about that. Yeah. He, um, he used to rock me to sleep at night and sing Over the Rainbow, so I have this insanely sentimental attachment to that song. Um, and he actually did a karaoke version that I have on somewhere on a CD in my house um, as a gift for me one time. Um, he, he would just, I think the house was a little crazy with Howie. And uh, so he would come home and um, sit in the bedroom with me and rock me to sleep and sing. So, uh, which was really a lovely memory for me. And, um, and you know, the song is just, uh, it's huge for me. That song is really, it's why I have all these Wizard of Oz things around the house. He was there, uh, physically. Um, he was, uh, for me, and I think my brothers would have a different answer to this. For me, he was more present, I think. Um, I remember one day coming home from school and there was a big box on the dining room table and there was a new dress in it, and there was a slowpoke sucker. I was about eight years old. And my dad took me to the ballet. Now, at the time, that's all it was. It was great, but it was that. Um, now that I'm older, I'm sure my mother forced him to do it. <laughs> I'm sure he didn't want to go. But I never knew that at the time. So he would do stuff with me that um, was... Uh, very sweet and thoughtful, um, and so and he and he was always there. I mean, he was there for homework help, although it was sort of hopeless to get math help from him because he could get the answer and then he couldn't explain how he got it, so it didn't really matter. <laughs> um, but um, he was, uh, and he was at the dinner table every night, and very present at the dinner table. And we, I mean, I've always had a very strong sense of how much it mattered to him to be, you know, sort of in the house and there. This is an interesting question to think about. Um, and I have a very close relationship with him now. I think I've always had a really close relationship with him. I always had the sense that he was there whenever we needed him. Well, he was there whenever we needed him because he was physically present. A lot of my friends had dads who traveled a lot. My dad was in the house and there. So I always, I guess there was some sense to me that he was uh, always available for anything. I never felt like if we went in the room and he was reading, which he was always reading, he was always reading, um, that we couldn't interrupt him or talk to him or that he wouldn't have time for us or that, you know, that, that didn't happen. Well, I always told my mother we have to talk in sound bites <laughs> because you, I, and sometimes I have gone in his office once in a while, not very often, and said, I need 10 minutes of attention. Focus here. Uh, and uh, if you can't do it, I'll come over to your house tonight because if the phone rings and you're going to answer it, we can't be doing that right just right now. Uh, and he'll do it. He, he, I've never had him say, you know, no to that. But, uh, I don't ask for it very often. And it's not because he doesn't want to, it's because I don't think he can do it that often. Um, 
So if you learn to talk in sound bites, and uh, he can just hear what you need, he will, uh, you know, he's then he's there. But it, I learned that early on, that if you start, you know, going into some long thing, unless you've explained to him ahead of time that it's going to be a long thing, and you need him to hang in there, uh, it, it, you lose him. You lose him to whatever giant thought he has in his head at the time that um, he was probably thinking about before you came in and really wants to get back to. And he gets back to it sometimes while you're mid-sentence, if, you, if you don't catch him right there. You know, I've always said she is the reason Berkshire Hathaway is Berkshire Hathaway, because my mother totally um, supported him, enabled him. Um, you know, she, she got it very early that he was going to be this, I mean, I don't think she knew what it was going to turn into, but she knew that there was something big there, and he needed that space and that uh, support to let it happen. And she did that. And I don't think most women would have actually been able to do what she did at all. He's an amazing person, starting with his integrity, and um, there's not, you know, an ounce of greed there in him, and never has been, and never will be. He doesn't, he doesn't really care about the money. He's doing what he does, what he loves to do, and by accident, you know, he makes a whole bunch of money doing it. But if he, if he didn't make a whole bunch of money, he'd be okay with that. As long as he was doing it, I think there's a competitive piece to him that wants to do it better than anyone if he can. But the mark of that ha by accident is the money in this. It's not, um, it wouldn't matter if it was something else, if it was something he loved and he was doing really well. We grew up in this very normal sort of situation, I would say, kind of the regular father knows best kind of situation. Um, he, uh, we, had, we got an allowance. We all walked right out the door the minute we got it and went to three different drugstores and bought candy and magazines and, you know, did whatever we did with it. Um, and then I'm sure he's told you the slot machine story about, yeah, so he's no dope. <laughs> Here, kids, put the money in the slot machine. Then, of course, he opens the back and gets all his money back. Um, but uh, he wasn't, he wasn't really, my mother was more, you know, the person who dealt with the money in the house when we were kids. And I worked and had my own, I had this thing in my room, it wasn't a piggy bank, but it was where I dropped, you know, all my paycheck money from my job. So I never felt like he was cheap or whatever word you want to use for him, thrifty. Um, yeah, I mean, there's the famous story about the kitchen uh, with me I had some trouble with that one just because I thought I was asking for a loan. I was not asking him to give me the money. And I thought, oh, come on, <laughs> can't you do this? But I think um, I used to joke with my mother. I said, I'm going to be on the cover of People magazine someday, homeless, because <laughs> my dad will be like this super rich guy and, you know, we'll all be wandering around. Um, but he's he definitely has loosened up as we've gotten older. I think part of it is that... Um, well, part of it's my mother, of course. She, I'm sure, was just, you know, poking at him slowly for years. And um, the other part is, I think, you know, he's got three children now who are adults, and we're not going to turn into different people. Whatever we are, we are. And, you know, it's not that bad. So <laughs> it doesn't make him nervous anymore. But, I, you know, I just, I, I basically, I think he's been right. Well, the first thing that comes into my mind is she was, and I think almost everybody who ever knew her would say this, she was one of the best people you'd ever know, ever. She was completely non-judgmental and uh, could see the good in anyone. I always used to say she could explain to you why Jeffrey Dahmer cut those people up and put them in the freezer. And, you know, poor Jeffrey, he must have had this happen and that happen. He didn't really mean to do this. I mean, my mother's the only person who could find some good in everyone. Um, and I think everybody felt like they were her best friend, um, because she, and, and the reason they would have felt that way is because the care and interest she had in them was genuine. Um, I don't know how she did it. I mean, sometimes I just think, you know, it was very real. I called, I called her at the Plaza Hotel one time years ago. She and my dad were in New York. They had just gotten there. My dad answered the phone. He said, well, mom's out in the hall. She's been out there with the bellman for about half an hour. <laughs> I thought, well, of course she is. Pretty soon she's going to come back. She's going to know all his kids' names. 
She's going to be sending him a check for the daughter's dance camp. She's and and she'll call him in a few months to check and see how things are going because she'll care. Um, she was very very unusual that way, and it was you know it was a hundred percent authentic. Um, I've never known anybody who had so much ability for unconditional love, and um, uh, complete just sort of acceptance of who you were, whoever you were. Well, it's a little hard for me to talk about early on because I was, you know, busy being three. Um, but I know he came, he was a very awkward, uh, insecure young man. Um, I mean, I'm sure he's told you that they had a special room for him at the school because he was such a problem. And he, you know, I mean, he, he was, I, which I always sort of like to tell, especially young people, because I think, you know, if you screwed up or you, you know, you, look, look what this guy turned into. And not just the money, but the person that he is, the human being that he is. Um, so anything's possible, pretty much. Um, but my mother, uh, I'm sure, as she did with everyone, but did it in a more intense way with my dad. I mean, she can see the good in everyone. She could see the potential. Um, she, I think, understood how much pain was there. And she was really good with people who were in pain or had experienced you know, some personal pain. And she was very good at sort of you know, she functions, functioned in a lot of ways as a therapist, honestly, because she would ask a lot of questions, she cared deeply, and then she would sort of help you think about things differently. Or um, I think with my dad, she, um, uh, talked to him a lot about where the pain was coming from, why you know, whatever was going on with him was going on. She probably heard him, um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that some of the things he probably said to her early on about how successful he might be or what he wanted to do, or I'm sure she probably thought, oh, right, you know, we'll see. But then, of course, it came true. Um, but she would have been very supportive and nurturing. And, you know, I... He, you know, like I said, he was present in the house physically and he was there, but he was upstairs reading all the time. And uh, she really, in some ways, had to develop her own life outside of that, which I completely get. Um, but, I mean, she was always so loving towards him. And so um, she would... Uh, You know, she would always publicly talk about, you know, how great, how smart, how wonderful, which she believed, and it's all true. Um, I, I just think it was sort of over the years, it just sort of, um, you know, it was what he needed. I don't know how to describe it exactly. I mean, they had a very, um, you know, physically together, they were very sweet with each other. You know, she was so physically affectionate with him. Um, and he was with her. But I don't know if he would have been that way if she hadn't sort of initiated all of it and made him so comfortable. Um, but she was very, they were very, um, you know, they, they had, you could tell they loved each other. It was, it was very clear to me that they did. My mother came from such a different kind of childhood. Um, so it certainly wasn't from her personal experience that she was, you know, able to do that. But I think she, um, you know, she did that with so many people on a smaller level, of course, because she wasn't married to them and living with them. But she was somebody, I mean, th that's why, I mean, <laughs> she just had all these people who, um, you know, just she functioned, she functioned as a therapist for a lot of people because she would listen to people about their family stuff and their personal stuff and, you know, whatever was going on in their lives and, and would sort of talk them through it and get them to look at things differently, think about things differently, um, and feel better in the end. 
it's, it is interesting to me that they both came from these very conservative Republican families. Um, so similar in so many ways. And my both sets of grandparents were actually friends separately. Um, I, it, I still sort of think, how did this, how did they come out the way they did? Because <laughs> it's completely not, you know, what they were getting at home from their parents at all. I mean, my grandpa Thompson was, he had this little chair, we called his nest when he was older and he would sit there and he had all his stuff around him. And there were two pictures, little cut out black and white pictures taped on the wall next to him. And one was my mother and one was Ronald Reagan. <laughs> you know, so it's just, it's, it's funny to me. I don't, I'm sure it was my mother who, but I will say my dad probably from his dad still had a deep sense of sort of, um, you know, what's right and sort of human rights. And I, I mean, so he would have gotten this, this, some of the integrity part of him would have come from his father. Um, so it, it just got sort of morphed into a more liberal Democrat kind of thing. But um, uh, I'm sure my mother, you know, she got involved in this panel of American women and it was a big thing. And a lot of uh, civil rights work going on in Omaha in the early 60s, and she was very active. And, you know, my dad was there, and I'm sure she came home and talked to him about it. And, you know, I, I think he probably just agreed with her and felt like she was doing the right thing. And, and uh, yeah, but I, I, I do think that periodically about how, uh, how strange it is that they both came out of these super nice people. I mean, my mother's parents could not have been more, they were wonderful people. But, and part of grandpa's thing, I mean, I used to think, you know, part of grandpa's thing was he would just kind of poke at you to get you to argue with him. So I'm not, I, I, you know, sometimes I think he said things he didn't even think were true to get you to think about what you were saying and argue with him. So, but he still had Ronald Reagan's picture taped next to him. <laughs> I, I'm the oldest grandchild on that side. So... I was 10 when grandpa died and we spent a huge amount of time with all of my grandparents actually when we were kids. Um, so I have a lot of memories of grandpa. We used to take these rides out in the country and they had, I still can't figure out now how we did this, but they had a car that had like a luggage rack thing along the back. I guess, I don't know. I don't think it was that unusual at the time. And my cousin and I used to like flip around on the luggage rack and um, we spent a huge amount of time with with uh, all of my grandparents when we were kids. So I have a lot of memories of grandpa. And then my grandma didn't die till I was, I don't know what, 30 some years old. So I remember her very well. I, you know, both, I, I, I remember all my grandparents. She was a tough cookie. Um, you know, I didn't personally experience uh, anything, um, you know, with her, I got along with her actually quite well. And I, but, you know, I was also the one who was here and I was at the end of her life the last few years. I was the one, you know, taking her to the doctor and paying the bills. And I did a lot of stuff at the end, the last probably five or six years um, for her. So, I was in, in high school, I mean, I graduated in 1971. So I was in high, junior high and high school in the 60s and Omaha, there was a, a lot more going on here than probably people think that weren't here. Um, and I was in a very racially mixed high school. So we had plenty going on actually in school too. And um, uh, my mother was very active in the North Omaha community and she was physically present and uh, involved with uh, a lot of agencies in North Omaha um, doing her panel of American work, um, American women. Um, and, and she was right there on the ground working. My dad was 100% supportive, but I, and I think the only reason he probably wasn't more there is it was, um, he was, you know, he was doing his job. <laughs> so, but he was um, completely supportive. And, you know, he did do some things. He, he helped start the boys club here. Um, with his uncle Fred, he and he was quite active in that. Um, he helped start the Black Bank here, and then of course he 
tried to join Highland Country Club, the all Jewish country club, uh, while his friend Nick Newman tried to join the non-Jewish club, um, basically to force it to happen. And um, and he was and he was he cared a lot about that because um, it was something I think he thought he could do and he could make it happen. And it mattered that it happened. And um, so he was he was not doing a lot personally. Um, but he, he did a few things in a big way, and he was 100% behind my mother. Um, she was singing all the time when we were kids. Uh, she, it was, mo it, that, most of that happened after I left, being the oldest of the three of us. Um, and she loved, I mean, she loved singing. And when she got sick, actually, one of the things that, she was most worried about was that she wouldn't be able to sing again. Um, but she, uh, I think when, once Howie and I were both gone, um, and my dad being the, <laughs> the character that he is, um, I mean, I think she figured out she was going to have to figure something out for her life because my mother would never in a million years have been happy being Mrs. Warren Buffett. I mean, that is so not who she was. Um, and so staying in Omaha, I think, would have meant to her, oh, gosh, you know, getting involved in all kinds of stuff that just was so not her thing. I mean, it just, it would have, it would have killed her. She couldn't have done it. Um, so I think the singing was a great outlet for her. She loved it. Um, she saw it as, uh, you know, I think it was something that was just her. And my dad loved it too. I mean, he was so supportive of that. And um, so I think she started to think, I probably once Howie was out of the house for sure, she started to see the writing on the wall here and, um, you know, just started trying to figure out how she could at least have some more, as she called it, you know, a room of her own, which ended up being outside, not a room in Omaha. Um, so... It was it was partly the singing, but I think it was also, you know, Howie, uh, well, that came later. I was going to say Howie, you know, married a woman with four great girls, and then they had their own child. And, you know, it, it, it started to morph into this thing where there were a lot of grandchildren, and, you know, she just wanted to spend more time traveling around and doing things. But I was so kind of not there during the singing stuff. You know, I knew it was happening, but I only saw her sing a couple times because I lived in California at the time. I do remember, uh, I, 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 it was devastating for him. And I came home because I, 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 I can't say I was mad at her exactly, but I kept thinking, how can you leave him? He's so... He can't function by himself. He can go to the office and do all that stuff, but I'm not sure he knows how to make a piece of toast. So um, uh, I came home. I was, I, you know, I, I had a hard time understanding it. I understand it really well now, but I had a hard time understanding it at the time. Um, uh I stayed home for, and I lived, I stayed at the house with him. I don't even know if he remembers this. It's funny because I remember a lot about it. But I remember doing his laundry at one point and, you know, whatever, it got done and I folded it and took it upstairs or something. And he said, well, that was fast. And I thought, he probably has no idea. He probably thinks it takes six days to do the laundry. I don't know. <laughs> He's never done anything like this. Um, but I stayed, I just stayed with him because I was so worried about it. And um, I, I think I was I think I was home for at least a month. Then I went back to California. I'm not sure what I was doing about my job now that I think about it. But um, then uh, I I I don't remember talking to her a lot about it at the time. But. Uh, you know, I mean, every life went on and everybody got used to it. But it was a hard time. I know it was a hard time for him. I mean, I can't even imagine what he felt like. In fact, I did make a joke at one point. I said, you know, mom could, we could make a tape 
of mom yelling, you know, bye Warren, I'll be back later, and then have the door slam. And you would just think she was here because he was always off reading and doing something, you know, and he didn't, I don't think he knew what she was doing most of the time. You know, she was off doing stuff either with the kids or in the community. Um, and then she had, you know, we used to joke, we had that little, we had a door hanger that had Lucy from Peanuts in her, you know, her little psychiatric booth that says the doctor is in. And we would hang it on the door at the house because she would go, she would leave the house at like 11, 11.30 at night and be gone for hours. And she would be driving around seeing what I used to call her patients. And that's what she would do. She would go around and, you know, visit people who were having problems with whatever and, um, you know, listen to them. So she wasn't really spending time with my dad. That was the funny part. So, you know, I, that's why I told him at one point, I said, we just make a tape of her. You'll think she's here then. <laughs> well, yeah, and there's many versions of this story and I can only tell you my version. Um, because I, and I think this is true. Um, although I've heard so many other versions, who knows what's true. Um, I knew Astrid before my parents did. Um, Astrid was friends with other friends of mine. She's a little, she's older than I am, but, uh, but she used to work down in the old market and I would be down there when I was home. I lived in California, but when I came home, everybody hung out down there and we were down there. So I knew her, I didn't know her well, but I did know her before my parents did. And then she got to know my mother from being at the French cafe. And, uh, so, and Astrid's a very sweet person. She's a, <clears throat> she's a true caregiver, really. Um, so my mother had told multiple women, I mean, I, I can name them, but I won't right now, uh, <laughs> to sort of look in on him, you know, cause as we all know, as she said before, he can't find the light switch. So, um, I mean, my aunt Dottie was one, you know, and, and, uh, so there were several women friends of his who I think were calling him up to go to movies and, you know, not to date him, just to hang out, to give him something to do. So Astrid was one of them. And um, she, you know, I, I don't think my mother, well, I, I'm almost sure this is true. I don't think my mother asked Astrid to move in with him. That I'm sure did not happen. Um, I think that was a surprise. Um, but I also think, you know what? My mother made the choice to move. So something's going to happen eventually. Um, so I think that my dad knew us. Well, I'm sure he knew Astrid before my mother moved because she was down there at the cafe when my mother was singing. And Astrid was around the house, actually, sometimes. My mother was having parties with people that were um, you know, involved at the French cafe and that she knew from the market and Astrid was around. I mean, she, she'd been in the house before, I think before my mother, well, I know before my mother left. Um, so I don't think it was quite the setup that people make it sound like. I think there were more women, <laughs> this sounds kind of weird, but there were more women, you know, she'd asked a bunch of her friends, check them out, check in on them, take him some soup, go to a movie, whatever. Um, and Astrid was one of them. And, you know, she ended up staying. <laughs> and my mother and Astrid were very close. You know, they really, really loved each other. I have a, the sweetest card that my mother saved that Astrid wrote when she was sick. I don't think it was the last time she was sick. I think it was another time. I'm not sure. But, I mean, it's just a very beautiful little card that Astrid sent, saying how worried she was about her and she loved her and you know, I mean, so strange as it may seem to people, I always think, you know, who cares? If it's working between the people who are directly involved, who cares what anyone thinks? Um, you know, I think that my mother was, she, she loved Astrid as a person. And I think she also was glad that she was there because she, you know, she loved my dad. She wanted him taken care of and happy. And um, Astrid is, there's no one better than Astrid. I mean, she's just, she loves my dad. She wouldn't care if he had one cent. I mean, she just loves him. And um, so that was, you know, it worked well for everyone. Astrid didn't want to be out traveling around with my dad. My mother and my dad traveled together and, you know, went to visit the grandchildren and did stuff with, you know, some of my dad's friends in New York who now have become friends with Astrid too. Um, and, you know, in this very weird way it worked. 
And I do remember my mother telling me one time that a friend of hers, and I will not name the person because she is still alive, but uh, said, you know, I, I wish I could have done that. You know, she said, and you know, I, I think that it was very, uh, you know, it was unconventional and I'm sure looked weird to people, but nobody was faking anything. I mean, my mother wasn't acting like she liked Ostrid or Ostrid wasn't acting, you know, it was all, it was all real and it worked. You know, we had Christmas together every year um, until 2002 was the last Christmas because 2003 she was sick. Um, yeah, I mean, it was just, you know, it just turned into this sort of new normal. Um, and everybody was fine with it. You know, my kids never didn't know Ostrid. Ostrid was like, in some ways, Ostrid was, um, you know, she was more present in their life and a lot of the time than my mother, just because they went over to her house when they were little, they were over at the house all the time, spending time with her. And so the, the younger kids didn't know anything different. I, I don't know how they ever sorted it out in their head when they were younger. <laughs> Grandpa, <laughs> at Christmas he's with grandma and, you know, I don't know. But, um, you know, it just, and it, it I think it probably took a few years to kind of figure out how it was gonna all work and, uh, uh, but then it just kind of turned into what it was, and I don't, everybody just kind of understood it. Well, I actually um, was in Arizona with her in October of 2003, and she had had the biopsy the day before she came to Arizona. So I was with her in Arizona at this Fortune Most Powerful Women's Conference, and she told me that she'd had a biopsy the day before, and I didn't really think much of it. Um, so uh, then we got home and the biopsy results were not good. It was stage four oral cancer. And I still didn't really know what that meant because I'd never known anybody that had oral cancer. So, um, and you know, some cancer's not horrible and some is a death sentence and oral cancer I think is sort of somewhere in between. Um, so she, called me and told me this and uh, I think I think I looked it up on the internet I, ca I can remember actually where I was sitting when all this was going on and it was such a weird thing because at the time what I read was it's uh, black men who drink and smoke and I thought okay she's none of those things um, so including she didn't smoke or drink so um, my dad, I can't, I, I think I may have called my dad and told him not to look on the internet, um, which I'm sure he'd already done. Uh, so it wasn't too long after that. We did go, she and I went to New York to visit, um, a doctor at Sloan Kettering. She, she knew she wanted to do it in San Francisco, but she wanted to just get, have somebody else look at her x-rays or whatever they had. Um, so our biopsy report, um, so we went to see this doctor in New York and on the way of the cab, she said, now, if I forget to ask the question, will you please remember to ask him if I can still color my hair after I have the surgery? It's like, okay. So we're in there for this like sort of awful thing and, uh, we're leaving. And I said, you forgot to ask the question, mom. She said, what? And I said, she wants to know if she can still color her hair after the surgery. He said, yes, that's okay. So, um, and then we flew back to California and, and I, I'm sure at that point we'd already scheduled everything. And um, it was quite a big surgery and it, it turned out to be less than they thought it was gonna be. It was still, I think, 12 and a half hours or something. They had thought they were gonna have to take uh, the bone out of her leg to rebuild some bone in her mouth, but they didn't have to do that. If they'd had to do that, I can't even imagine how much worse it would have been, but uh, they still had to take a whole bunch of tissue from her arm to put inside her mouth after they did, you know, the stuff they had to do with her tongue. So I, we all, we were all there. Um, and uh, my dad and my brothers left after a few days. And it was, it was 
really awful for a while. I mean, she was in the ICU and it was really awful. She couldn't talk and she couldn't, I mean, she had a tracheotomy and it was really bad. Um, and then I stayed with her for a month, I think. And then I really was with her for the next about uh, four months or so with a few short exceptions. I came home for Christmas because it was the first Christmas we were gonna have without being in California. Um, so I came home a little bit off and on, but I, I really stayed almost the whole time. My dad came out every weekend. It was hard. It was not, it was hard. I mean, because it was such an awful, you know, she couldn't talk, she couldn't swallow, she couldn't eat, she couldn't, you know, it was terrible. I mean, he, <laughs> you want to see him read the paper? That's when, <laughs> that's when he reads the paper. The morning, the day she was going into the surgery that morning, uh, he and I were in the hospital room with her and they were going to take her in like, you know, in 10 minutes. And she said to me, come here. Come here. So we went in the bathroom, and he's, you know, like this, reading the paper. I'm sure he's crying behind the paper. He's just sitting there. And uh, she said, now, you know, he's a wuss. She said, I told him they, they were going to, you know, do whatever they do initially, and within 45 minutes they would know if the cancer had spread. So she said, I told him if the cancer spread, I want them to close me up and not do anything else. She said, I don't think he's going to tell him that's okay. I think he's going to tell him to do whatever they can do. So she said, you have to make sure he does that. I said, okay. So fortunately the cancer hadn't spread, but, um, and then they, you know, took her off into the uh, operating room. And, uh, and about 45 minutes later, Dr. Isley came in and said um, it hadn't spread. This is, this is how freaked out my dad is. So, and we all are, but you know, he just, he, it, this is really huge. Um, Dr. Isley comes in and says, it hasn't spread. You know, we're going to continue. Now it's going to be a long time. Uh, and we said, okay. And so he walked away and my dad looked at me and he said, what did he say? Did it spread or not, sis? I said, no, it didn't spread. Oh, okay. And then he felt like we could go get something to eat. You know, he just, but he, it, it, he didn't even hear it. <laughs> so, you know, that's, it was, um, it's funny, he, there's some of it he just can't, you know, he just can't, the thought of something happening to her was just, for him, you know, it was just the worst thing that could happen. But she, you know, she came out, and I think he probably needed to go home at that point. He needs to go, you know, disappear into his office, and um, he knows she's got excellent care, and he knows um, I'm there, and, you know, I'm going to call him if there's any reason to call him, and, and he showed up every weekend, and the first time he showed up, actually, it was kind of funny. He called, it was probably the week, you know, like a week later or something. And he called me and he said, you know, let, we're, let's go to Johnny Rockets when I get there. Get some dinner. And I said, okay, but I said, we have to get, I have to get mom in bed first. Now she's in bed in the hospital, but there's a, like a whole thing that has to happen. I said, I have to get her, you know, ready for bed before I can leave. And uh, he said, well, how long does that take? I said, it takes about two hours. <laughs> it does? I said, yeah. But it was great because he came and he sat in the room and he watched, you know, what all the stuff that we had to do to just to get her ready to sort of kind of go to sleep for the night. Um, and then we went to Johnny Rockets and, you know, he was, uh, he was good. We surprised him the one time that she, um, when she finally took the thing, they had removed the um, tracheotomy thing, whatever it is. And um, we didn't tell him that when he got there that time she was going to actually be able to talk. And so... That was kind of a fun moment. She loved you too. And um, so at night, um, every night when she went to bed, I always say went to bed, she was already in bed, but when she went to bed, um, we would, uh, she had a feeding tube and uh, so, um, and she couldn't talk. So she would write these notes to me. I, and it's funny, I, I, I have a huge pile of paper of all the notes she wrote to me when she was sick. She didn't know I kept them, sorry. Because um, some of them were so funny. But uh, she would write me a note every night of the song. She, we had the Rattle and Hum DVD, which is an old DVD, and she loved it. And we, um, she would write the songs that she wanted to listen to that night. And the last song was always um, All I Want Is You. 
And so we would play the song, we'd show them on the DVD, the songs, and then she would, uh, we would shoot the pain meds into the feeding tube and the sleeping meds. And uh, then we'd put on All I Want Is You and she would go to sleep to that. So in November, I was in Washington at the Library of Congress at something with Bono and he said, and they hadn't met either. And <clears throat> he said, how's your mom doing? And I said, uh, I said, she's, you know, she's doing fine. And uh, I said, she listens to, she watches the Rattle and Hum DVD every night before she goes to sleep. He said, really? <laughs> I said, yes. And I said, and she, and she listens to different songs every night, but we always end on the same song. So when she died, he called and he said, uh, I want to come and sing the song in her service, which was really sweet. Yeah. She okay. met him on May 10th, which is his birthday, and it was Mother's Day that year. Um, they, Bono and, uh, Allie and I think both the girls, Jordan and Eve were in, uh, New York and we were there. It was after the Berkshire meeting. And I mean, she was like a little kid. She was so excited, so excited to meet him. And, um, uh, so they came over to the hotel and we had, uh, lunch and, you know, just, we had the dining room and the suite and it was really nice. And, they, they just had a very sort of instant, really wonderful connection. And he brought her over on my wall over there, uh, this very amazing painting that he did of her as a total surprise. Um, and actually, he told me when he, they, Katrina, his assistant, had asked for a picture of my mother for this painting that he wanted to do. And um, we sent him the picture that's in the painting over here, which is her in Ghana. Uh, she was dancing with a lot of women in Ghana. And Bono said to me, you know, it was so interesting when I got that picture because he said most people send sort of a, you know, a headshot. But he said, I got this picture of your mother. And he said it just, it sort of captured who she was, even though I didn't know her. So he did this really very cool thing that's over there um, for her. And they just had a, and then she and I went to France and stayed um, at his house in Ez in late June, right before she died. And that was uh she wasn't sure she was going to be able to make the trip, but um, it was really, I mean, it gave her such energy to be there. On the way home, she never went to sleep. She had the headphones on, and she was listening to U2 the whole way, and just how I said, what happened down there? He said, it, she's like, just like a new person. So it was, very, it's, it was a short but very um, lovely relationship. No, she did not die of cancer. I think everyone thinks that she died of a stroke. Um, she had, she and my dad had gone to Cody, Wyoming, which they did every year with a bunch of friends. Herb Allen has a ranch there. And um, uh, I was in Boston at the Democratic Convention. And for some strange reason, I decided to come home a day early. And uh, I had come home. I was dead tired from being up way too late every night. And um, I was going to watch, I think it was John Kerry was going to speak that night. And uh, my dad called and said, I need Dr. Isley's phone number. This was, I don't know, 8 o'clock at night or something. And I, I, I didn't ask why or anything. I just thought, boy, this is not good, whatever it is. I got him Dr. Isley's phone number. And then he called back about um, 45 minutes later, maybe not quite that long. And he said, something happened to mom. I'm in an ambulance. Um, you need to come. Now, I thought, well, you know, he would call me if she stubbed her toe. <laughs> so we're going to figure this out. I said, okay. So I called NetJets and... Uh, got a plane, and he called back again, and he said, um, you need to find your brothers and bring them. So I said, okay. So um, I called, Peter was in Omaha, and I called Peter, and I said, there's a plane at midnight or whatever time it was. And Howie, I found Devin in the Walgreens in Indiana on her cell phone, and I said, where's Howie? And she said, he's on his way to South Africa. He's in a plane. So I said, okay. I don't know what's going on. I'm still in my head thinking, we'll get this figured out. So um, I said, just have him call me when 
you know, he lands. I think Devin gave me the phone number of somebody who's picking him up or something. Anyway, somehow I figured out what I was supposed to do. And uh, Peter and I got on the plane and I packed a bag <laughs> for like three weeks because I totally in my head, I'm thinking, okay, we're going to call in the nurses. We're going to call in Kathleen, my mother's assistant forever, the most amazing person, and we'll fix this. So, because my mother had this little group of nurses that had taken care of her. And um, so how, Peter and I landed. I don't think I talked. I, well, I think I did talk to Howie right before. He must have just landed before we took off. Um, and I told him, I said, I don't know what's going on, but I'll call you. And so we um, uh, got to Cody. It was the weirdest thing for me. I, I was in the hospital with Mrs. Graham after she fell. And so there was a lot of sort of deja vu. Herb, it was during a herb thing. And it was at a hospital that's there for skiing accidents and not, you know, people having strokes and... So we went into the hospital room and uh, my dad was sitting there. He'd been sitting there all night holding her hand. I was so proud of him because he hadn't done any, you know, excess measures or whatever. You know, he, he, when it came down to it, he knew what he was supposed to do and he did it, um, which was nothing. <laughs> um, she had a little oxygen thing on her face, and I thought, this is so interesting because she had told me a few months earlier that her biggest fear was dying, suffocating and dying. And so I thought, well, she's, that, she's not going to be gasping for breath, so that's good. She didn't want that. And um, uh, my dad went to sleep then, and Peter went to sleep, and I sat with her. And um, my one regret is I didn't bring my iPod. I thought, oh, she would have loved to have some music playing, but I forgot that part. Um, so I sat with her, and uh, I just kept putting my hand on her heart to see if she was breathing. And um, at one point, you know, I didn't feel anything. So I went out and I got the nurse. And I said, um, can you come in here? And she said, no, she's gone. So I have to say one of the worst moments of my life was waking my dad up to tell him that. It was horrible. And a total shock. You know, she'd been fine. She'd been fine. They went off to Cody, and she was fine, and they were having dinner, and, you know, she didn't feel well after dinner, and she had the stroke, so. You know, he just was sad, crying, sad. I thought, in my head at the time, I thought, God, I don't know if he'll ever get out of bed. I mean, this is like the worst thing ever, and, um, but he did. I mean, but we, you know, so we went, um, took a while to get out of the hospital because they have to do all this stuff with, you know, she's in Wyoming and we have to move her out of the state and all this, there's a lot of paperwork that goes on then. And, you know, he had to do stuff with um, Mark Hamburg at Berkshire and make sure that whatever stock-wise, you know, all that stuff. And there were a few people that I needed to call because I didn't want them to hear it on the news. I mean, obviously Howie, but there were a couple other people. Um, so I did that, and uh, I sat in the room with her. I just didn't, for some reason, I didn't want her to be by herself. Um, so everybody kind of went into their little jobs that we had to do, and then we flew her home. And it was the day before my birthday, so I got home, and I went to the mortuary and did what I had to do at the mortuary. My dad got under the covers, and... Uh, I got home from the mortuary and the doorbell rang and it was the UPS man with my birthday presents from my mother, which I opened last year. <laughs> I waited 10 years. Yeah. She told us the music. She um, wanted only family. Um, and she, uh, yeah, and then she had one thing she wanted me to read. You know, she had, she had given us some stuff. The only thing she didn't tell me was where to put her ashes. So I figured, well, she must have figured I could figure that out because that's the only thing I actually didn't know. Um, but uh, she's been telling me since I was, you know, 10 years old what funeral, we had a joke about her funeral music. And uh, so all of a sudden she died and I thought, uh-oh, now I have to remember all those songs, which I remembered all but one. Um, so I had Brad Underwood come over and uh, he put together this whole uh, thing of the music for us and um, 
and then we actually put, uh, I had played one of Peter's songs and then uh, we ended the service with her singing Here's to Life because it just seemed perfect. Um, so yeah, I mean, she's, the funeral music has been queued up for years. <laughs> Well then Bono, the first call I got actually when we landed was him saying, you know, can I come sing? And I thought, well, it's going to be so little. I don't know if it's worth your time, really. Um, but he said, no, I really want to do this. So he, um, he flew in with Allie, his wife, and uh, Bobby Shriver, and um, practiced with Mike the night before my son. Mike played the guitar, and Bono sang, which was amazing of him and beautiful. I don't think so. I don't think anything would have threatened my mother, really, because their relationship was so solid and so, it, it was sort of such a different relationship than he would ever, ever have with anyone else that I don't think, I don't think anything threatened my mother at all. Um, uh, no, I mean, I, I don't think, I don't think so. In fact, I'm, I just can't imagine. And I, I just adored Mrs. Graham. I mean, she and I had a very close relationship, so I, I don't think so. I... She was um, working with Alan Greenberg, my ex-husband, who still runs the foundation um, and is amazing, uh, doing women's reproductive health work around the world. And then there was a, there's a little piece, too, that's college scholarships. It's not that little. It's 20-some million dollars. But... Uh, uh, my mother loved traveling to sort of the worst parts of the world and meeting the people and spending time with them and learning about what, you know, what she and the foundation could do to make their lives better. 110%. I am so proud of what we do. And, and, and we have our board meetings and I just think, I almost cry at every board meeting because I just think she would be so proud. It's absolutely what she would do. And that is my biggest job, in my opinion, is to make sure that every penny gets spent the way she would want it spent. He loves it. He's the worst eater and he loves it. And he's healthy. That's the problem. He's healthy. So, you know, I said to him once, I said, what if your doctor told you you had to start eating only lettuce or you would die? He said, well, then I would eat only lettuce, but I'm not going to do it now. You know, he has like perfect everything. And he eats the worst possible. I mean, it drives, I, you know, he doesn't drink water. He doesn't drink water. And he doesn't do anything he's supposed to do. And he's healthy. Charlie had been working on some sort of large thing about my dad. And um, he had wanted to talk to my mother. And my mother sort of went back and forth because she just didn't like to talk to anyone. Um, so she finally agreed because it was Charlie and she trusted him and she figured he would be good to her. So if she was going to do it, she would do it. And thank God she did. Um, so we, Charlie set it up in a room in the plaza so she wouldn't have to do anything because she was really not so good at this point. Still, um, we sort of did this thing where we'd think one thing a day. What are you going to do for, you know, because she was so tired still from the radiation. Um, so she, that morning, actually had said, I don't know if I can do this. And Charlie knew this might happen and uh, was fine with whatever worked. And so uh, she said, I'll try. She said, maybe I'll just do it for 10 minutes. I just feel tired and I'll do it for 10 minutes. I said, okay, so we'll go down there and we'll tell Charlie, you know, you'll do what you do. And uh, so we went down there and she um, started the interview with him. And I think it's 45 minutes long about... She didn't cough. She didn't have to drink her water. She was completely amazing, I think. Um, and I'm so grateful now that she did it because it's the only thing we have. But um, she was fabulous. And so we were leaving and walking down the hall, and she said, how did I do? And I said, Mom, you were great. You know, it was, couldn't be better. She said, well, are you sure? You know, I didn't make any mistakes. I said, no. I said, you're going to be totally happy with it. It was fabulous. And she said, oh, let's go to Bergdorf's. <laughs> so we did. We went to Bergdorf's, where she sat in a chair, but she was still at Bergdorf's. I think he would want it to be uh, about him, his character and uh, who he is as a person. 
Um, I don't think he would necessarily want it to be that he was, you know, the second richest guy or whatever he is. Um, I think he would want it to be about um, uh, his character and who he is. And and even though I I don't think of him as a philanthropist because he doesn't personally give away the money except he gives away all the money to other people to give it to, I think that would be the other piece of it is that you know, with all that money he did make, he made sure it went out to do as much good as it could do in the world, um, and not to sit and you know, pay for 25 boats and 16 houses. And you know, he just doesn't care about that. He cares that it goes it goes out to do a lot of good. I think he would hope that his legacy had to do with his character and who he is as a person, rather than how much money he made. Well, we bought the house, we, my parents bought the house in 1971. I was a senior in high school. So, um, and it was a little bit of a haven, I think, for my mother to kind of go escape and sit and look at the ocean. And um, she really was very, very connected to that house. Um, my dad, you know, doesn't get connected to anything like that. Um, he was, he liked being out there because we were all out there and I think that was fun for him. And, you know, he liked just hanging around out there. Uh, but he has no real sentimental connection to it. And I think actually it would be painful for him now to be there because it, it was so, it just was so her. Howie wrote me a letter after he went there, after she died, and he said, I don't think I can come back again. It's, it's just too painful. I don't feel that way. Um, I like it that it feels like her. Um, but, you know, everybody's different that way. So um, uh, it's, it's a very, uh, you know, it's just a special place. And it's, and it's right by the ocean, and it's beautiful, and it's open, and it just feels, uh, feels like her. When, and some of my friends have stayed there and said, I like going there because it reminds me of your mom.